The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So a few years ago, Sherry and I were in northern Michigan. Uh, we go back for two weeks every summer, Sherry, all Sherry's family, and our roots are there. And so we uh, go back every summer for two weeks. So we, we are in northern Michigan. We found this little restaurant called the Twisted Olive. It had maybe 12 tables, teeny little place, but it, the food was so good. The environment was wonderful. It had a view of Lake Michigan. And so every time we're back there, we have a meal there, at least one meal there. And every time we have a meal there, Sherry and I have almost the same conversation. And it goes something like this. Oh, I wish that so-and-so, this couple who were good friends, they would love this place. Oh, if they were here, we'd take them to this restaurant. Or if this family member was here, we'd go to the restaurant. And, and over, year after year after year, we've had that conversation until finally this summer, our son Zach and his wife Christine were able to come and sit at the Twisted Olive, view of Lake Michigan. And we were like, this is the best. Because we had, we'd been enjoying it, but we wanted to share it with someone. You know that feeling? Have you ever had that experience like that? Well, wh why in the world would we sit there and want someone else to come to that restaurant. Because we don't like them. Because we want to oppress them with our food choices, right? I mean, we want them to come because we're mean, nasty people that want to force food down other people's throats, right? No. Why did Sherry and I for years want someone to come and enjoy that with us? Because we love them. And we've experienced a great meal that we want to share with someone else. That's what people do when they, when they love something. When we're out in creation, Sherry and I, and if we see a beautiful garden or a beautiful sunset like this one, I took this picture just a few weeks ago when we were in Michigan, we have the same conversation. Sherry will say every single time, we're in a beautiful place in creation, oh, my dad and my mom would love this. They love beautiful gardens. They love sunsets. And so if it's a beautiful place, I'm just waiting because Sherry's going to say, I wish we could bring my parents here to see this. Why would we want to impose such beauty on her parents? Why? Because we love them. Because we know that they would enjoy it. If they got to see that, they would find beauty in that. For years, when I would hear a new worship song and find something on, on YouTube, I, I kind of put a loop of worship songs on YouTube, so I hear a new song. For years, I would send a link to that YouTube with that worship song to my sister Allison because she loves music. Now, I was sending her links to YouTube videos of worship songs before she became a Christian. But she, she would sometimes send a note back and say, oh, it just made me cry. It was so powerful. She wasn't a Christian yet, but she loves music. And it touches her heart and it touches her soul. Why would I send links of songs I like that move me to other people? Because I love them. Because I'm thinking, I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking to myself, if I thoroughly enjoy this and I know them, I know that they would enjoy this too. That's what we do as human beings. When something touches us, when something moves us, when something has beauty that we drink in and enjoy, we think, I want to share that with somebody else. How much more, how much more the goodness of our God? When you meet God Almighty as a follower of Jesus, when you meet your heavenly Father and you find this out, there is a God who made you, who knows you, and who loves you. I mean, that's powerful. When you encounter Jesus Christ, when you come to the cross and you learn that all your sins and all your wrongs and all of your guilt and all of your shame has been washed away and <coughs> thrown in the deepest sea and it's gone. When you learn that, you want people to know about that. When, when you experience the Holy Spirit of the living God move into you and empower you for the things that you couldn't do on your own. When you... And I, I've, got plenty of, I've got plenty of lozenges. Thank you, sweetie. My wife, <coughs> I've got a tickle in my throat. My wife is getting me bottles of water and lozenges. Thank you, sweetie. <laughs> but but when, 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 you, when you become a Christian and the Holy Spirit of God moves into you and you experience the power and the presence of the living God through the Holy Spirit, man, you want other people to experience that. And so here's the question, and this is a very honest question. If 
if experiencing the, the love of the Father and the forgiving grace of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, if experience that is like the best thing in all the world, why don't we more freely share that with somebody else? Why is it so challenging for so many Christians to share their faith in a natural way with other people? And here's the answer. Here's the answer. There's a certain kind of, there's certain Christians that have either the gift of evangelism or the call of an evangelist. There's certain Christians that have this natural ability given by the Spirit of God to share their faith freely. But every study would show that's only about 3 to 4% of Christians. So only 3 to 4% of Christians, when they become a Christian, they're like, hey, I just naturally freely share my faith. It doesn't make me nervous. Other people seem comfortable with it, and it just flows out of them. That means 96 to 97% of Christians would say, I have people I love that don't know Jesus, and I want to share my faith, but it doesn't come naturally for me. And most of you, if 96 to 97% of Christians, that's the case, that's true for most of you. Now, I'm in that 3 to 4%. When I became a Christian, I just started sharing my faith. It didn't very naturally. I thought, this is easy. But I'm also gifted as an evangelist. That's what God's called me to. My wife, Sherry, is in that 96 to 97%. She loves people who don't know Jesus, but she doesn't just share naturally. She has to learn how to do it and work at it. Say a little prayer for my, I'll kill this when I got to turn it off. Say a little prayer for my throat. I'm going to be fine. We're going to get through this. Relax. Um, <laughs> I'm fine with it if you're fine with it. But, um, but my wife, Sherry, um, loves people, but she doesn't have the gift of, it, of an evangelist. So she has to work at it. But here's what I know. If 3 to 4% of Christians have the gift of an evangelist, if 96 to 97% of Christians don't, I know this, and this is important, 100% of Christians... 100% of Christians have someone in their life that they love and they care about who doesn't yet know the love of Jesus. 100% of Christians do. And I know this. If you're a follower of Jesus, even if you're in that 96 or 97% that doesn't do it naturally, I know that you want to do whatever you can to help that person come closer to Jesus. And so I want to ask you just to do something for me. I want to ask you to just quiet your heart. And if you want to bow your head, you can do that. And I just want you to think about who is one person in your life who you love, who you care about, who doesn't yet know the love of God and the grace of Jesus and the tender presence of the Holy Spirit. And just put that person in your heart right now. Put a picture of them in your mind. I want you to think about that person. Because today, you're going to be encouraged by God and given some ways that maybe you can help walk with them a little closer toward Jesus. Maybe for you that person is a, is a child, one of your children who's estranged and they're not walking close to Jesus and they might be in their teens or 20s, they might be in their 50s or 60s, but they're your son, they're your daughter and you just want with all your heart for them to know the love and the grace of Jesus. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's your husband or wife who you love them and they love you but they don't know the love of Jesus and your heart just aches and longs for them to know the love of Jesus. Maybe it's somebody who you work for or somebody you work with or somebody who works for you, somebody in the marketplace, somebody in the workplace. And, and they don't know that there's a God who loves them. They don't know all their sins can be washed away and you just want them to meet Jesus because you know Jesus would change their life. Maybe it's a neighbor, somebody at school, somebody at, your, at the golf course where you play or the tennis club that you play at or that you play pickleball with or whatever, whatever it is. It's just somebody out there in the community and you love them. And you just know if they could meet Jesus, their life would be changed for the better. Dear Jesus, we pray today as we look at your word, as we think about what it means to really love people so much that we would take the chance and maybe even a little risk of walking with them towards you, Jesus. I know, Jesus, that 100% of those in this room who have come to the cross and received Jesus, 100% have someone they love they have that one person they care about that they want to know you, Jesus. Would you speak to their hearts today? And, may, and Lord, I pray today for those here in the worship center and in the family worship venue and online who don't yet know you, Jesus. I pray that they would listen for themselves and discover, God, that you love them and you have a great, beautiful, wonderful desire and plan to guide their life forward. Meet us in this time, Jesus, we pray for your glory. Amen. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. 
We're continuing in this series on the book of Acts, and I want to let you know, uh, next Sunday, we have a guest preacher. He is the president of Phoenix Theological Seminary. His name is Dr. Del Husay, and he's, come, he's been coming here every year for, I think, over a decade, maybe longer. And so if, you've, if you're new at Shoreline, and he is just an amazing communicator, he gets as enthusiastic as I do, or more so, and he might even at moments talk faster than me. You tell me next week what you think. But he is so passionate, such a great man of God, and, so, and a great communicator. You'll want to be here next week when, when Dr. Darrell comes and continues on this study in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 17, it's a fascinating chapter of the Bible because there's three stories, three situations where the apostle Paul, this guy who just a short time before hated Christians, hated the church, was killing Christians, destroying Christian homes, he met Jesus. His name was Saul. He met Jesus, and he got a new name, Paul. He got a new heart and a new mission. And, and the apostle Paul began going around trying to share with people about Jesus. What's wonderful about Acts chapter 17 is there's three different stories, and each story he's in a different place with a different kind of people. And so every time, he kind of shares about Jesus differently because there's not one way to talk to somebody about Jesus. You're a different person than the person sitting next to you. And if I'm talking to you, I'm having one conversation. If I'm talking to you, I'm having a different conversation because you're different human beings. So there's not like, oh, here's the way you always talk about Jesus. So what I want you to notice in these three short stories is that each time the Apostle Paul does different things, and I think what you can do is listen and think of that one person that you love that doesn't yet know Jesus. And one of these stories will have one or two ideas that will strike you and you'll say, wow, that will help me to share my faith, to walk with this person a little more closely with Jesus. That'll help me on this journey with this person that I love and care about. So listen to Paul's journey, but listen for what God wants to do in you. And if you're part of that 96 or 97% who say, sharing my faith makes me nervous, there's a couple things God wants to teach you today that'll make you say, I feel more confident, and I'm gonna take a next step. So look with me at, at Acts chapter 17, verses one through nine. And the first story, and if you're a note taker, you can write this in your notes, it's sharing Jesus with very religious people. Sometimes we get a chance to share Jesus, or sometimes the, the person we're walking with, that one person that we're caring about, they're very religious, they're just not Christian. They might have grown up in, in, in the Jewish faith, and they're culturally Jewish, meaning they say, well, I got bar mitzvahs, I got bus mitzvahs, I, I, you know, I go to synagogue occasionally, I don't really believe in that, but I, you know, I'm, I'm Jewish because it's a culture, and maybe someone like that, I have a friend like that, they're, kind of, they're culturally Jewish. They might be a devout Catholic. Now, there's many Catholics who believe the gospel, who know Jesus. But there's other people that grew up in the Catholic church who've never understood that Jesus is Savior. They, they have religion and prayers, but they, don't, they haven't met Jesus. Maybe they're religious, they just haven't come to meet Jesus face to face. And you're walking with them, and you love them, and you care about them, and you want them to know Jesus. Maybe, uh, maybe the person you're thinking about is enthusiastically new age. I mean, they are super spiritual. And, they, and, and they're into spirituality. It's, there's not a relationship with a living God, but they're very searching spiritually. Uh, maybe it's somebody who grew up in an overbearing Christian home where Christianity was just kind of like just forced on them and they know all the Bible stories and they know all the religious information but they're like, I don't want anything to do with it and they've kind of pushed away. Maybe it's somebody who grew up in a church just like Shoreline or grew up in Shoreline and they've heard the story of Jesus many times but they've never connected from their mind to their heart and they've never received Jesus. There's lots of people who have religious experience or still engaged in religion, but they don't know Jesus. How did the Apostle Paul interact with people like that? Well, look with me at Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. We'll start in verse 2, and just look at what happens. There's some lessons we can learn that will help you if that one person you're walking with is kind of religious, but they're not yet a follower of Jesus. Verse 2 says this. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue. This is the center of religious life in the ancient world for the Jewish people. Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, three Saturdays in a row, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. He opened the Bible and he talked about the message of Jesus, explaining and proving that the Messiah, Jesus, had to suffer and then rise from the dead. This is a quote. He says, this Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. He said, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. A bunch of people put their faith in Jesus. Their lives were changed. But other Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters in the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed into Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. One story. 
Paul and this team of people serving and sharing Jesus go into the synagogue. They go into a religious center. What are some lessons we can learn if, if the person you're thinking about, if someone you're walking with is very religious, but they're not yet a follower of Jesus? What lessons can we learn? Here's a lesson. Look for spiritual interest and curiosity. Look at people that you're walking alongside. If they have spiritual interest and curiosity, listen closely, that's a good thing. You say, well, yeah, but their interest is in all the wrong stuff. Okay, maybe, but they're interested in spirituality. So talk about your relationship with Jesus Christ because here's the reality. When people are speaking, seeking spirituality and religion, they can get certain prayers to say and activities to do and certain actions to be part of, but there's no heart and no relationship with a living God. That comes in Jesus so their curiosity, if, they're, if they're, you can see they're searching and seeking, say, man, that's great. Way to go. But can I share with you how I encounter God? And, if they, and their hunger and their curiosity can then begin to point them towards Jesus. So look for that interest in people. Next, consistent conversations are key. Have consistent conversations. The Apostle Paul, he says, for three Sabbath days in a row, for three Saturdays in a row, he went and he talked with people about Jesus. He went back and talked with them more about Jesus. He went back and talked with them more about Jesus. Sometimes we sort of think, well, one encounter, one conversation, and oh, they didn't respond, I'm done. No, hang in there. Hang in there. My brother Jason, who's now, who's now a follower of Jesus, who is now a worship leader in his church, who now is married to a great Christian woman, and they have six kids, and their kids love Jesus. For, for like 15 years, my brother pushed back and pushed back, but we had dozens of conversations about Jesus. And we just kept having the conversation. It, was, it wasn't like I'd see my brother Jason. I'd bump into him. Hey, Jason, good to see you. Can I tell you more about Jesus? Whoa, come on now. Let me bring it. You know, I, that, that just freaks people out. You know, I, but, but we would just, we shared life together. And I love Jesus. And Jesus is in my heart. So Jesus comes up in my conversation. But we kept having, I'd say, Jason, where are you at with the whole Jesus thing? Man, I'm no interest. Okay, great. That's where you're at. Where are you at? Well, I'm more curious. I have some questions. But we kept having conversations. Keep having conversations with people, especially if they're spiritually curious. Another lesson we learned from the Apostle Paul, use your mind and be reasonable. The passage says, week after week, he went in the synagogue and he reasoned with them from the scriptures. He, he talked with them. They thought together. He reasoned with them. We live in a day and an age where people don't reason together anymore. You know, there's a passage in the Old Testament that says, come, let us reason together, let's think together. Now people debate and argue. But they just read, he just, let me tell you what I see here. Let me share what I believe the Bible says about Jesus as the Messiah. Those people in the Jewish synagogue were waiting for a Messiah. And the Apostle Paul said, this Jesus, who I'm telling you about, he's the Messiah you've been waiting for. And he began to open up the Old Testament, the beginning parts of the Bible, and share all the prophecies pointing towards Jesus. This, this year at Christmas time, we're going to be going through Old Testament prophecies pointing to Christmas, pointing to the coming of Jesus, God with us. We're going to do a whole study of the prophecies of the Old Testament and how they were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's what the Apostle Paul did week after week with them in the synagogue. And so reason with people and talk with people and think. And, and if they say, well, I really disagree with you, say, don't, don't go, oh, I don't know what to do. Just say, oh, tell me why you disagree. And listen. Have a, have a, a smart, reasonable conversation. And sometimes you'll agree on things, sometimes you'll disagree, but keep having those conversations and be reasonable. Another lesson from the Apostle Paul is that the biblical story of Jesus is powerful. The, bibli the story of Jesus Christ is powerful. And when you're talking with people, even, even very religious people, you can say, I, I want to tell you my journey, my story with Jesus, how I've experienced him. I can tell you the story of Jesus, how he came and lived and died and rose again, but I can tell you how he moved into my life and changed me. Tell the story of Jesus. And, and another lesson the Apostle Paul shows us is this. Some will be very open and some will be very closed. I mean, when the story ends, some people, men and women, different backgrounds, put their faith in Jesus and they begin to, to walk with Jesus. Wonderful. Some people got a lynch mob and went after trying to drive Paul and Silas out of town. I mean, so, some people got it, some people didn't. That's, listen closely, that's life. <laughs> Not everyone's going to agree with you on everything, but you share your story and you walk with people. And some people are more ready than you realize. One Sunday morning, Sherry and I were sitting here like we do after service. Usually I'm up here praying with people and then after that I'll come be over here and talk with people. I think it must have been after the third service because we lingered for quite a while, but Sherry and I were over here and this, this, this woman came over to us. She was in her 70s. Been raised Jewish, very religious. Been in the Jewish faith her whole life. And so we got talking, and, she, and I asked her about her background. She said, well, I'm, I'm Jewish. And I said, well, tell me about that. And so she started sharing about it. 
And I said, I said, now, I said, do you, what do you think about Jesus in terms of the, what the Bible, you know, the Bible says that Jesus is the Messiah that came, was prophesying, and I just kind of walked through how the Old Testament said that the Messiah would come, and that, that Jesus said, I am that Messiah, I'm the Savior of the world, and I kind of walked her through that, and she goes, she was like, and I could just see her eyes light up, like, really? It's like somebody, nobody had told her this before. Well, she was just visiting here. She was here for one Sunday. And I really felt in my heart, I needed to say, you know, do you want to know this Jesus as your Messiah, as the Savior of your life? And so I just said to her, you know, this is what the Bible says. And we did a little Bible study together, the three of us over here. And I, I said, do you want to know Jesus as your Savior, as the Messiah? And she said, yes, I do. Sometimes people just say, yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> and so we sat together right over here right where Sean and Amy are sitting right there. And we prayed with this beautiful, wonderful woman. And she became our sister in Jesus Christ. She put her faith in Jesus as the Messiah. She had been religious for her whole lifetime, but she realized that she never had a relationship with God that's built through Jesus Christ. Other people won't be as open. But here's the key. It's not my job or your job to make somebody open or close to Jesus. It's our job to walk with them, to love them, and just like we would say, I, I gotta take this great restaurant. Or I gotta, you gotta see this beautiful, this beautiful place in creation. I gotta tell you about this Jesus who's so wonderful and so good. And if you knew him, I know he'd change your life. We get to share that story with people. So people that are very religious, there's a certain way you kind of connect with them. But then there's another group of people the Apostle Paul encounters in Acts chapter 17. It's sharing Jesus in the marketplace. You say, what's the marketplace? It's where you work. It's your business. It's, it's maybe kind of the marketplace of ideas. It's social settings and sports teams and community groups and, and where you golf or where you swim. It's just kind of being in the community in both work, business, and social settings. It's kind of out there in the world. So look what happens in verse 16. It's a whole other experience. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, now watch this, as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there, just the people he bumped into. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? They call Paul a babbler. It doesn't even make sense, they say. Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And with Paul, it always came back to Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. Now he's in the marketplace, but he's still having conversations about Jesus. It's just a different setting, so it takes on a slightly different form. So here's some lessons from Paul in this passage in Acts 17, 16 to 18. Here's a great lesson. The in-between times of life can be open doors for the gospel. Paul was waiting for them in Athens. Just, you ever wait? Just, you know, it's a lot of fun, just waiting. Now, when you're stuck waiting somewhere, say, Lord, you know, look around. What's happening in my world? What's going on? Is there, is there an open way to share your love in some way? While he was waiting. There's these little moments of life that just sort of pop up, and God gives you an opportunity to share the love of Jesus in some way. Sherry's got a great story. I won't retell it for you. She'll tell it sometime. But, but Sherry's a great story of being in, on a plane, flying somewhere, and it was just her, and there's this guy next to her, and he had the, you know, the earphones on, wasn't really having a conversation. But they hit like one of the worst Patches of air shares ever experienced, just like the plane was just dropping all over the place. And this guy kind of took his headphones off and just, they started talking. And over the next half an hour or hour, Sherry got a chance to share about, he, he was kind of trying to figure out his own spiritual life. He was curious and it just, they had a conversation. She got to share about Jesus and send him a couple books that might help him and build a way just to share a little bit to help this person on the next step on their spiritual journey. You don't know where the place is, but be available because anywhere could be a place that God might open a door. Noticing the culture and the norms helps in the outreach process. Uh, when the Apostle Paul is there ministering, he, he understood the culture where he lived. He didn't talk with a bunch of Jesus-y language and religious sort of inside you know, code words that nobody would understand. He just talked like a, like a regular guy in a regular world. And if he was with academics, he'd talk about academic stuff. And if he, if he was with you know, the artists, he'd talk about artistic stuff. And, and he, he uses, you know, in his letters, athletic imagery and all. He just talked about life like a, like a normal, regular kind of person would talk. And that's what we are. We're, we're ordinary people seeking to share the extraordinary story of Jesus. So when you talk about your faith, listen closely. Don't use religious language. Just talk. And if you can weave what you're saying into the world around you, utilize illustrations and ideas that are part of our world. Also, we learn from Paul that emotion is a powerful motivator. When the Apostle Paul looked at the situation, saw all these idols, he was distressed. 
he, he, he was emotionally in turmoil because he's looking and he's seeing these golden and silver and stone idols and he's realizing people are devoting their lives to nothing, to a rock, to a stone idol. And his heart grieved. He's like, I, they're worshiping a rock when they could be worshiping the savior of the world. They're worshiping something's empty when they could be worshiping the one who is the giver of life. And he had an emotional response. My sister Gretchen shared her faith with me. Out of her own, she's very personally, very quiet, very shy. And I was very hostile and resistant. But my sister Gretchen felt so much for me and loved me so much. And there was so much emotion. She just thought, I just believe that Kevin needs Jesus. And man, I needed Jesus. And her emotional concern for me drove her past her fear and past her shyness. And some of us in that 96, 97% of people who say, but it makes me nervous, say, God, let me so love this person and feel so much for them that I'll push past my shyness or my fear to naturally try to share about Jesus and take that next step in loving with them and walking with them towards Jesus. In Paul's journey, we discover that any location is a good location if we use wisdom. There's no right place to share about Jesus. It's wherever God happens to put you. I've had great spiritual conversations on chairlifts when I'm snowboarding. And you're on, you're, you've got seven minutes on this chairlift, and you're going up with a different person each time. And, and it's not like I sit next to him and say, hey, can we talk about spiritual things? We just, you just start, you just talk. But, but if, if people, there's, there's just in the midst of conversations, my, my love for Jesus, my, my, my joy over him moves me to talk about him in all kinds of places. And in a line at a store, in, in a school, and anywhere you are, you can talk about Jesus. And then another lesson from Paul in this setting, in the marketplace. Many people are open to talk, even if they have strong opinions and don't get what you are saying right away. The people that Paul's talking to are like, this guy's babbling, we don't understand it, but we'll keep talking. That's the conversation I have with my dad sometimes. My, my, my dad is, is, you know, when my one person that I carry the most in my heart that I want to know Jesus is my dad. Since the day I became a Christian, it's been my prayer and my desire to see my dad know and love Jesus. And there's times we have conversations where I know he's like, I don't understand the world you're coming. Yeah, he gets it intellectually, but he's like, I just don't get where you're coming from, but that's okay. He doesn't always get me, but one by one, my brother Jason didn't understand me until he came on to the cross and knew Jesus. Allison didn't understand kind of the way I worked until she came to the cross and met Jesus, and I believe one day my dad will come to the cross. I'm praying for that still, and he'll say, now I understand why you're so passionate about Jesus, but he can't fully get that yet, but that's okay if people don't fully understand and then, I love this uh, other lesson from the Apostle Paul. Stay focused on the good news of Jesus, on the gospel. Stay focused on the message of Jesus. Whether the Apostle Paul was in a synagogue or in the marketplace, in the conversation at some point, Jesus comes up. And here's the thing about the story of Jesus and the story of the gospel. It's so simple. I mean, here's the whole story. God loves us. We messed up called sin, and we're separate from God. But God has a solution for our problem, and that is that Jesus came and took all of our sins, died on the cross, and rose again. And our response is to receive his forgiveness, to take the hand of Jesus, and to walk with him through the rest of our life. You ready for this? That's the whole story. I could never say, God loves you, you need Jesus because of sin, God has a solution for your sin, Jesus died, rose again, and you can receive and live with him. I, it would be too hard to say. No, it wouldn't. It's about 20 seconds. It's really not that complicated. And so we got to say, okay, but the Apostle Paul always comes to the simple story of Jesus. And then the last setting is the academic setting, the academy, the cultural centers. Sharing Jesus in the academy and the cultural centers, Acts 17, 19 to 34. This is if you're interacting in a school context, a university, a college, in a government setting, maybe in the world of arts and entertainment, kind of the cultural um, centers of, of the world, whatever kind of gathers in those places. And so the Apostle Paul is actually invited to the Areopagus. The Areopagus is sort of the educational thought center of that part of the world at that time. And so people are gathered there, and all they did all day long was think about new ideas and ponder ideas and, and debate and discuss and think about new ideas. So Paul gets invited to speak there. So in that conversation, as he's sharing with them, as he's, as he's speaking, he says this in verse 24. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. You see, they had all kinds of temples all over the place. They were so religious but they, they, I mean, they had a temple for every god you could think of, and then they thought, well, if we missed any gods, we'll make another temple and call it the temple for the unknown god. 
It's kind of like a junk drawer where you know, like at your house where you can put all the pencils and pens and stuff and you put everything in there just close it. Well, here, any gods that we miss, they could just go to that temple. They were so, so the apostle Paul sees this and, 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 he's, and he's saying that but God doesn't live in these man-made temples. He's bigger than all of that. He said he, and, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. He, we don't contain him in a temple. He made us. He gave us life and breath. For one, from one man, he made all, na- all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. But listen to this. Though he is not far from any one of us. We think we're reaching out looking for God, but he's right there waiting to wrap his arms around us. For in him, now he quotes their poets and their philosophers. This is a quote. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. He quotes two different poets or or philosophers of the day. So now he's in the intellectual center. So now he's quoting their philosophers, their poets. And, And so there's lessons we learn for that kind of a setting. And some of you, the person that you love and care about, they live more in that world. So maybe there's lessons here for you. Here's a lesson. Curiosity is powerful. These people were looking for something. They were searching spiritually. Don't make fun of people who are searching spiritually. Just because just you look and say, well, they're not searching in the right places that'll give life. They're, they're doing this or that thing. Don't, don't mock people. Don't make fun of them. Don't think less of them. But say, boy, they're searching. And you know what the Bible says? If we search for Jesus with all our hearts, he'll be found by us. So to cheer people, say, I'm glad you're searching. I'm glad you're seeking. Boy, I'd love to share with you how, what my journey has been like and what I've discovered. Oh, would you? Sure. People that are hungry spiritually are usually hungry spiritually. And so share your story also. Curiosity is powerful. Pay attention and affirm what you can. You know, the Apostle Paul says, hey, man, I noticed that you have all these temples and you're really very religious. You know, good job, yay, good way for being, you know, good job for being religious. But there's more. Let me tell you about the, the God you've missed. You got a temple for that God. I want to tell you about that God. He says, I love your passion, I love your hunger, but I want to redirect you towards Jesus. Speak to the longing of the heart. Um, the, these folks in the ancient world, they, they were so, they, they created this religious system where they had temples for every different God and then they had another temple for the God they didn't know who it was yet because they just, they didn't want to mess up. Their hearts were longing to please God. The problem is they were pleasing idols and that, not, that which means they were pleasing nothing. It was Emptiness. But Paul says, I want you to know this God who made you and who made the heavens and the earth and who loves you. And he doesn't need temples that you build with your hands and you don't have to prop them up like a, a wooden or a stone or a gold or a silver image. But he made you and he gave you life, a new vision, right? And so you, the next thing is you paint a picture of the God we worship. The apostle Paul said, you gotta know that this God that, that, that you are longing for is so much bigger and greater than you understand, You speak with common cultural language. The Apostle Paul, now that he's in this environment, he's speaking their language. He's talking to them in a way that made sense for them. We've got to watch what we say and then give a bigger picture of God. He says, your picture of God is this idol, but the God I'm talking about is the God who rules the universe and he loves you. That's powerful. That's life-changing. And then invite people to real life change. He actually says to them, we need to repent. We need to stop and turn around and live a new life. And can I tell you something about the one person, the person you're carrying in your heart today that you want so much to know Jesus? They want more from life than what they're experiencing. They do. You say, well, you don't know them. No, I don't. But I know this. Until we meet Jesus, there's always way more that we want and long for than we're experiencing. And when we meet Jesus, we find the one who can satisfy us because nothing else fully will. So I know, I know those folks are longing for more than what they have. And when Jesus says, when Jesus calls us to follow him, he says, turn and follow me. And the apostle Paul says, we've got to repent and follow Jesus. It's leading people to a whole new life that is glorious and beautiful and powerful. And then, keep Jesus in the center of everything. Boy, the Apostle Paul, it doesn't matter if he's in the synagogue or in the marketplace or in the academy. Jesus is there. 
He's going to talk about the love of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the hope of Jesus. So that one person you're walking with, that person that you love and care about that doesn't yet know Jesus, you just keep praying, Lord, give me the right opportunity and the right moment to share a little bit more about Jesus, to share about how Jesus is changing my life and how Jesus leads me and guides me. And then also, be ready for a variety of responses, including faith, including faith in Jesus Christ. Be ready and understand, as you walk with that one person, when I was, when I was walking with my brother Jason, I, I would share Jesus with him at different times, and I'd talk about, about how much God loved him and where he at, Jason, I'd hear his stories and where he was searching and seeking. And most, many, 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 many times, I'd say, well, where are you at, Jason? Are you open to really take a step towards Jesus? Many times he said, no, no, that's not for me, or I'm not ready for that. But there was a time where Jason said yes to Jesus, and his life has been changed. There's a point where my sister, who had tried to encourage me and, and, in her own shy way, share music with me and invite me to church things, and she just kept reaching out to me, and I pushed back, and she got a lot of bad responses, but there was a day when I finally said yes to Jesus. And you need to know something today if you're a follower of Jesus. You are that one person in someone else's life. Someone was praying for you, your grandpa, your grandma, your dad, your mom. Somebody was praying for you, a friend, and loving you and showing you towards Jesus. And if you're a Christian, you came to that point where you said yes. So don't lose hope and don't be discouraged. And if you're that 96 to 97%, never say, I can't do that. Just say, God, give me strength to walk with one person one step closer to Jesus and see what God can do. Oh, Lord Jesus, we pray today. We know that 100% of those who've come to put their faith in Jesus Christ, we all have at least one person in our life that we love and we care about and we want them to know, God, how much you love them. So we say, oh God, use us and fill us and work through us. And God, as we, as we right now, as we listen to this song, as we make this our prayer, I pray that we would, God, I pray that we would actually make ourselves available a little bit more than we were when we walked in here today to share your love, to share your story, to share your goodness with that one person you've put in our lives. Let us think about your great love for us and how we want that love to be shared with others. Just let God minister to you through this song. If you know it, you can sing along. Just, you may want to just listen and let God speak to you about that one person he wants you to walk with closer to Jesus.
come to the cross and receive Jesus, that is true, then you want that one person or other people in your life that you love and care about. More than going, bringing to a great restaurant or introducing them to a beautiful location, man, to let them know that they can be set free, that there's a God who loves them, there's nothing more wonderful.